How's that? Is that better? Okay. Right. Are there any other announcements? Nothing else. Besides, it is Christmas this morning, or Christmas, well, Christmas. So Merry Christmas to everybody. We hope you got lot of, lots of presents. Okay, if you didn't get, I hope you're going to get some still. <laughs> uh, we're going to try and keep it as short as possible to get everybody out here as soon as, as soon as possible. Not that they don't like seeing you, but I think you've all got Christmas lunch is waiting for you. Alright, so no other announcements. Nothing else, okay. Uh, Henk and Alka are going back the 31st of Jan uh, December. Yeah, well, we wish it was the 31st of January, but yeah, no, they've got to go home. So please remember the 31st traveling verses for them as they travel back. Okay, no other announcements. Let us open with a word of prayer for this morning. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we are truly again blessed to be able to assemble like this this morning. Father, that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in your name. For that we can come before you, call you Father, that we are able to call Jesus our brother Father, that we are all your children Father. Grateful for the blessings that you daily bestow on us, for the blessings of the week that has gone past and Lord is always eagerly looking forward to the blessings that <coughs> await us in the new week to come. Father we are grateful for the rain that is falling outside, that brings nourishment to the earth, Father, that brings water to our dams. Father, we think of those parts of our country that are currently inundated with rain. Lord, that have got too much rain at the moment for those parts of our country that have got no rain. So, Lord, we ask you to, to be with all of those parts of the country that are struggling with rain, with the parts of the country that do not have rain, Father. Father, we at this time think of Hank and Alka as they have traveled down to be with us and as they travel back up again the end of this month, 
back home. So Father, we ask that you be with them to grant them traveling mercies as they travel on our country's roads. Father, for everybody that is on our roads at the moment, to give them traveling mercies, Father, to grant them patience as they commute to wherever they are going. Father, to be with us this morning, guide us and lead us in everything that, that we do, that our worship to you may be acceptable, acceptable in your sight, and may rise before your throne as a fragrant offering. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. He
Ancona. With it comes massive responsibility. Sorry, I lost my hand. With it comes massive responsibility. Responsibility that will sometimes scare us. Where does it leave us? When Jesus came to, to this earth to walk amongst everyone and to share the message and ultimately know he's going to die on the cross. At some point he was also afraid. And what does the next year bring or is sitting up in front of us when it comes to responsibility? You know, for the kids, Responsibility to go through another year of making sure that they take everything in that the teacher is trying to tell them. You know, for the, the college going kids, the responsibility to balance friendship and Christianity at the same time when you're in varsity. And for us as a congregation, this responsibility we have as a leadership to, to start talking to our sister congregation's leadership see if we can get together and be one congregation as a whole. So with responsibilities we come obviously a little bit of anxiety. And sometimes you could say that, you know, are we really ready for this? And then the other day I read a thing on, online where it says that the words do not be afraid is written 365 times in the Bible. And it pricked my interest, so I went and I looked at it, and it's not written 365 times, it's just, it just suits the person's narrative that, that wrote it. But it is written 140 times. So, if you read the scriptures, at least every third day of the year will we read, Do Not Be Afraid. And then I went through, you know, I scanned through the scriptures, and literally from the first book in the Bible, in Genesis, until the last book in Revelation, the words of, do not be afraid, is written there for us. You know, I think, just last night, obviously Christine's brothers here, and Chris too, he's got an older brother who's in Boston, so they, they give more responsibility as well. And it takes, it takes a certain element to talk to someone about Christianity. You have to pick your time, you have to just, you can't be seen to be you know, dogmatic about it, or be like a bulldog and bark about it. And just talking about Christianity was not just in my house. <coughs> and it just shows that we've got a lot of work to do as a congregation. A massive amount of work to, to do. Um, you know, Christy's father is a baptized member of the Church of Christ. So he's got a massive responsibility. And saying that comes from character. So let us not take the opportunities we have in the 2023 like Let us grab it by the scruff of the neck, knowing that Jesus was afraid of the task that he was given. But he went ahead as he was instructed. I will read two scriptures for you today. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. And the peace of God will transcend all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Does say will guard your heart and your mind. Does necessarily, necessarily say will guard your body or your physical person. But our hearts and minds will be guarded. And then the last one I want to read. In Psalm 56. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I'm not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And that's the message I want to leave you this morning, the Lord's table, is that it's, it's natural to be afraid. It's natural to take that task that you don't really think you are equipped or ready to do. But 140 verses in the, in the Bible, if we keep on reading our scriptures, 
We'll get it every second day, at least every third day. A reminder, do not be afraid. Let's go to the prayer. <coughs> Those who partake of these items this morning, as we partake of the bread, we know that the body of Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind, Lord, we know that it's just a resemblance, a symbol of what we partake of this morning. Bless each and every one this morning, Lord, as we take this moment to just think back of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus has given to us. We ask you of each and every one in Jesus' name. Thank you. Praise Him, praise Him.
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. In case you don't have your Bibles with you. Voila. Kindly brought to you by Eskim. Who has given us relief from our Lord no chilling today. Our lesson this morning is entitled O Christmas 3. And a wise person continues to seek and worship Jesus. The world at this time, reflecting on the birth of Jesus, and what we find in this season that we celebrate, is that when God entered His own creation, it wasn't tidy and neat, and it wasn't so ideal. So today we focus on the story of the three wise men, sorry, the wise men. The Bible says, doesn't say there were three, who were called Magi. And we find this narrative in Matthew chapter 2. And the title is O Christmas 3. And I know you probably think I made a mistake and I said it should be a Christmas tree. But it is three for a reason. It is supposed to be a Christmas tree. It is a tongue away, a tongue in cheek way of looking at something, of focusing on our text this morning. And what we're going to find in our text this morning is that there are three series of threes in it. The number three in the Bible signifies completion, unity, or perfection. When you think of God in the Bible, there is one God in three persons. It speaks of Jesus' ministry on earth lasting three years. Many significant events in the Bible for instance, Jesus laying in the tomb for three days and he rose on the third day. So in this passage there is a series of threes that are specific to the story of the wise men and that can be applied to us in different ways. And the first one is that there are three kinds of people. There are those that are hostile towards Jesus. There are those that are indifferent to Jesus. And then there are those that worship Him. Three types of people in the time of Jesus. Three types of people in the world that we live in today. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. So when you think of this verse in Proverbs, it says we need to keep or to guard our hearts because out of it come the issues of life. <coughs> Why? Because out of our heart comes issues of life. If you look at every situation, every issue in the world, if you deduce it back and you trace it back to its root cause, you will find that it is almost always a heart issue. There is something in the human heart that keeps us from being the kind of people that we should be, the kind of people that we know that we ought to be. It's a lack of compassion, a lack of love, or a lack of wanting to involve ourselves in the lives of people or in the needs of the world. So when we come to the three kinds of people, it is important not for us to think of them just as a few thousand years ago, but that those same three kinds of people exist even today. The first kind of person that we find are those that are hostile towards Jesus. 
And in our story, in our narrative this morning, it is King Herod that is hostile towards Jesus. And this king, this ruler, is actively trying to get rid of Jesus. Why? Because think of yourself as a ruler and you hear of as another ruler. You want to keep your position, you want to keep your power, what are you going to do? You're going to try and do everything in your power to keep your position, your money, everything that you have. And this child is challenging his power structure. You find later in the Gospels when the Magi, the wise men, don't go back to Herod. That Herod actually tries and he does go about persecuting the children because of his imagined somebody coming to take or trying to be a rival for his throne. There are many people today in the world, when you look at their heart, that there is hostility towards Jesus. Jesus is intimidating to our own personal power. We don't want to give control of our lives to someone. We want to keep it all to ourselves. It is my life. I'm going to do with my life what I want to do. Nobody is going to tell me what I am going to do with my life. People are hostile towards Jesus. People would rather that Jesus did not exist. There's hostility towards Jesus. And that is a heart issue. <coughs> this was God's promised child that God sent into the world. And yet Herod was still hostile. The second kind of people that we find are those that are indifferent to Jesus. And in our account this morning, do you know who was indifferent to Jesus? The scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests. The Magi come seeking Jesus, they know where he is to be born. But the scribes, the Pharisees, don't go out to meet him. There are many people indifferent towards Jesus. And it is interesting in our account this morning that those who are indifferent to Jesus are those that are the most religious. They know the scriptures. They knew he was to be born in Bethlehem. They heard that he was born. They say we know what the scriptures say. But we don't actually want to go and meet with Jesus. There are many in the religious world, there are so many denominations today that try and keep Jesus at arm's length away. Religion is a way to keep Jesus away. Why? Because religion and the Christian gospel are different from one another. Religion says, I obey God, so God accepts me. So I do all of these religious things, and therefore God is in my debt, and I am supposed to get whatever I want. But that's not what the gospel says. The Gospel says, I am accepted, therefore I respond to God by seeking to obey His will. When we know and we realize we are accepted, we now suddenly know that God is not in our debt. We are in God's debt and therefore do we just come to Him and we say, thank you. So in our narrative this morning, the religious leaders are indifferent. They knew he was born, 
They just didn't want to go near him. But you know what's also interesting? A lot of people are also indifferent to Jesus, not because they're religious, but because they are spiritually apathetic. They just couldn't care less. They know that He is God. They know that He is born. They know that He died on a cross and rose again. But for whatever reason, it doesn't move their hearts at all. Imagine if you had a life threatening disease or an illness. You needed a heart transplant or a kidney transplant or a liver transplant. And somebody says to you, I am willing to give up my life for you so that you may live. Are you going to be indifferent to that person? Are you going to say, oh well, yeah, you know, great, thank you. You've given up your life for me. That's great, but hey, I'm alive, so cool. And you just get on with your life. I don't think so, right? When somebody says, I'm willing to give up my life for you, so that you may have life, that's going to have an impact on us. We are going to be spending the rest of our life thinking, I need to live my life differently. Somebody gave up their life, gave up everything, so that I might be here. And the third kind of person is those that, are, that worship Jesus. And of course in our narrative this morning, these are the wise men and magi who have come to worship Jesus. They are seeking Jesus. They won't stop until they have found Him. They have gone to great expense, traveled great distances to find Jesus. And when they find Him, they lavish gifts upon Him. Secondly, there are three types of revelation. There are three types of revelation that we find in our narrative. And the word revelation in the Bible is a Greek word, apocalypsis. We get our, we get our English word apocalypse from it. Now I know when you think of the word apocalypse, you think, thank goodness for Bruce Willis. Because if there's a meteor here hurtling towards earth, Bruce Willis is going to get on a shuttle and he's going to nuke that thing. So thank goodness for Bruce Willis. When we think of the word apocalypse, we think of the end of the world. But the word apocalypse does not mean the end of the world. It actually means to reveal or to disclose. God wants to reveal who He is into and through each one of us. God wants to reveal Himself in and through our lives. In this passage there are three types of revelation. General revelation, specific revelation, and then personal revelation. <coughs> General revelation is the star that the wise men saw. <coughs> the, star, the star that precipitated or began the journey for these wise men. It's a way that God reveals Himself through nature to the world in what He has created. We need to realize that through everything that God has created, God reveals Himself in some specific general way. When we see the rain, when we see the ice, we see the moon, we see something blossoming. That tells us something general about the God who created us. And in this narrative, the Magi see the star that is leading them towards Bethlehem. That is general revelation. The 
The second type of revelation is specific revelation. And that specific revelation is when the Magi say the King of the Jews was born in Bethlehem. The specific revelation of God is through God's Word, the Bible. From Genesis right through until the book of Revelation. God reveals himself specifically to the wise men and God reveals himself specifically to us today through his word. Some people say, and I'm sure we've heard of this all, the Bible's okay, whatever, but nature is my church. But the word church actually means a called out group of people. See, nature can't be your church because church is people and nature is just, well, it's nature. But the, the reason God doesn't only give us general revelation, but He gives us specific revelation as well, is that God, because God knows that if he does not tell us specifically who he is, we are going to make up our own ideas about who God is. We are not only going to make up our own ideas about who God is, we are also going to try and make God in our own image. It was Friedrich Nietzsche who said God created us in his image and we've been returning the favour ever since. Left to our own devices, the average human being is going to make God out just like them. Liking who they like, hating who they hate, valuing what they value and devaluing what they do not value. God revealed Himself to us specifically in the Bible to challenge us to change all our presuppositions about who God is and what God values. So God reveals Himself specifically to us in the Bible. And the third revelation is personal revelation. And of course God reveals himself personally to these wise men. In the same account in Luke 2, we find the angels revealing themselves to the wise men. God wants to reveal himself personally and intimately to all of us. To all of humanity. But unfortunately there are the kinds of people that are hostile towards him. There are the kinds of people that are indifferent to him. <coughs> they just don't care about who God is and what God has done. God is a relational God. God wants to have a relationship with humanity, with mankind, with his creation, with each and every one of us. Psalm 19 lays out exa exactly the same thing for us. So there are three types of revelation, general, specific, and personal. There are three kinds of people, those that are hostile, those that are indifferent, and then those that worship Him. And then finally there are three officers of Jesus. We finally realize the three gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus. Now because of the gifts that were given to Jesus, people think there were three wise men. But the text doesn't tell us. So they reckon there are three gifts so there must have been three wise men, one gift for every person, right? But again, the Bible doesn't tell us how many there were. The three gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus, each of them has a meaning. 
Nothing in the Bible doesn't have meaning. Adrian pointed out so well at his Lord's table that he did that even the thorns that God cursed creation with had a purpose. And those very thorns that God cre cursed creation with were the thorns that were placed on his son's head. The three offices that Jesus hold are king, are priest, and are savior. Look at the three gifts that these wise men brought. They brought gold, they brought frankincense, and they brought myrrh. The first office that Jesus holds is that of king, and that is symbolized by gold. And we need to realize that gold is not a commodity that we have like today where, you know, you just go down to the jewelry store and you get yourself some gold. It didn't work like that. Gold was an even lesser commodity in the olden days, and it was mostly kings that had gold. Stashes, great stashes and treasuries full of gold. And so when the wise men bring gold to Jesus, they are saying that this child is the king of the Jews. We are seeking the king of the Jews. And the gold shows that Jesus is king. He is a king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The second office that Jesus holds is that of priest. And an interesting note is that nobody can hold all of these offices the whole the same, at, or at the same time. There was only one person in the Old Testament that held two of these offices at the same time. And that was Melchizedek, king of Salem, and also priest, because Abraham offered tithes to him. But Jesus holds three offices at the same time. Not only did they give Jesus gold, they also gave him frankincense. Frankincense is a type of incense. And the incense was very common for priests. It was a sweet fragrance that, they, that was always burning in the temple for God. And when they brought Jesus, frankincense spoke that this child was not only a king, but this child was also a priest. In Jesus' culture, priests were the mediator between the community and God. They stood between the community and God. They witnessed to the community about God and who God was and they spoke to God on behalf of the community. So Jesus, as we read in the book of Hebrews, is our great high priest, the mediator today between us and God. And then finally the third office that Jesus holds is that of Saviour. So not only is this child a king, not only is this child a priest, but this child is also a savior. And that is why they brought myrrh. Myrrh was an embalming sacrifice. When you think that in those days when people died in that culture, they used to embalm the bodies with frankincense, with myrrh, and other spices. And when you think about the reality that Jesus was given myrrh at his birth, speaks about his death and his resurrection. So not only is he a king, priest, but he is also a savior. I want to close with two scriptures this morning, and they are both found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the first one is verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have been made new. 
And that speaks to Jesus as Savior. No matter what our issue is, no matter how bad this morning was, yesterday was, last week was, no matter how bad we think our lives are, if we find ourselves in Jesus, because of His death and because of His resurrection, the past is the past. We have been made new in Jesus Christ. And then later in the same chapter, in verse 21, he says, For he had made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We have to remember that the child that the world celebrates today, who was laid in a manger, who lives or who lived a perfect life, so that we could also live, died the death that we deserve, but that He rose again. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. People have worshipped Jesus for 2,000 years. Only the wise will continue to do so. The church is one foundation in Jesus Christ our Lord. He is His dear creation by water and ever. From any name and source to be His holy ground. With peace of mind. so much to be thankful for. 
thank you for everything. If we look back, if we turn around where we are today, we can only say thank you. It was only through the hand of God, of you, your son, that helped us thus far. And now, Lord, as we shall part today, during the week, the next couple of days, as we shall travel, as we shall be on the roads with family, go back to work and school. Yet ons will play, sorry, as so believe on school and after who the wees. We see ons linker in ons rechter kant, wees sy oor ons hoofde, en wees sy onder ons voete, Heere, wees sy binnen ons harte, en in ons gedagtes, en laat ons lippe oorvloei, van u goed en tierende, van u liefde, van u vreugde, Lord, we pray all of this, in the wonderful name of Jesus, 